All right, we'll get started. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Amy Clausen with the Niagara on the Lake Museum and thanks for coming out to the next talk in our virtual lecture, lecture series. We're recording today's session. So if for some reason you get kicked out or you can't stay for the full program, don't worry. We'll be recording it and putting it up on our YouTube channel. And we'll also send it out to everyone who registered today and also go out in our newsletter. So you have lots of opportunity to see it. We've got the uh, Q&A functions and the chat box open, so feel free to put any questions for the speaker today, or you can chat back and forth with each other or make comments, um, and then I'll field questions to the speaker at the end. Also, if you'd like to support any of our free programming, like our lecture series and other programs and exhibitions, we always appreciate donations, and I've put a link to our donation page in the chat box as well. So today we have with us Caitlin Best to present Apothecaries to Pharmacies, Prescriptions, Potents, and Healthy Herbs. And Caitlin's currently working with the Niagara and Lake Museum as a digitization coordinator. She was hired under the Ontario Trillium Foundation for a year to work on making more of our collection accessible online. Caitlin received her BA in classic, Classical and Near Eastern Archaeology from Wilfrid Laurier University and a certificate in Museum and Gallery Studies from Georgian College. While working on the digitization at the at the museum here, Caitlin became intrigued by the labels and images of the, on the medicines that would have been found in the Niagara Apothecary. So here she is to talk about some of the treasures that she has found. And I'll leave it to you now, Caitlin. Thank you, Amy. I'm just gonna share my screen and get this started. And there, okay. So it's uh, nice to have you all here with me. Um, I just want to start off that I am not an expert in this topic. However, um, while researching and scanning all these labels, uh, I thought it would make for an interesting presentation. Uh, this is just a small portion of the collection uh, around medicine and the Niagara Apothecary. There were other apothecaries in Niagara-on-the-Lake, Newark, Niagara, whatever town you want to call this, um, throughout all of our time. Um, I'm starting with a quick history of the Niagara Apothecary and then some of the interesting items that explore the apothecary to pharmacy development, um, including items that need prescriptions, um, healthy herbs, potents, uh, and overall awesome items from our collection. Um, so the first question I had was what is an apothecary? So apothecaries are a common ancestor of the modern day pharmacy, hospital, and liquor store. Uh, apothecaries sold the ingredients to homemade remedies, as well as preparing goods and herbal medicines. Uh, when still used as medicinal treatment, tobacco was also sold through the apothecary, which today uh, you can't buy tobacco products from Canadian pharmacies. Um, is the location that is a pharmacist. An apothecary is a term of professional like an apothecary is a title for a person. Before modern medicine, apothecaries performed the duties of a general physician, surgeon, psychiatrist, dentist, optician, optometrist, and a few others. Uh, they offered products like alcohol and drugs that required an expert or a chemist to mix and manufacture. Like a pharmacy, apothecaries offered medications from dietary aids to even morphine. But times have changed once the world market became involved in pharmaceutical product, products, the apothecary as it was known began declining. Some apothecaries so the person did attend medical school. However, most learned the trade through apprenticeships, which was customary of many career paths at the time. Our first person to own the business was actually Rodman Starkwather. He established a pharmacy practice sometime between 1818 and 1820 in what is now Niagara-on-the-Lake. At that time, much of the town had been rebuilt after being burned by American soldiers in December of 1813. The first known newspaper ad for the pharmacy is from 1820, which is why the beginning is a little bit unclear. And they identified the practice as the Niagara Apothecary at the sign of the Golden Mortar opposite Smith Tavern. So it was located on Prudhoe Street. 
It was also one of several pharmacies or apothecaries in the early town, um, some owned by physicians and thus created a competitive situation. Uh, Niagara on the Lake was not what it is today. It was a small town that served primarily a farming community. In the early 1820s, Starkweather took on a partner named Brown and the professional character of the practice changed to be more of a general store in order to stay ahead of the competition. They still offered the medications, but just also have been advertising whiskey by the barrel, dry goods, crockery, paints and varnish, and a variety of patent remedies. The practice developed enough so that they were able to announce the discontinuation of the dry goods and revert to the more professional Niagara Apothecary name and practice. Then in 1829, Starkweather returned to a solo practice. And just a few years later in 1833, he sold the practice to James Harvey. James Harvey operated the apothecary from 1833 until his death in 1851. Early in his practice, Her Harvey is believed to have imported from Britain most of the containers that are still on the shelves in the Niagara Apothecary Museum. He was very community-minded and was involved in Niagara's first council in 1845. He was on the police board and was a charter member of the Niagara Mechanics Institute, which later became the town's public library. Building a publicly trusted reputation helped him to stand out from other similar businesses. And it wasn't until 1908 that Canada instituted regulations as to the efficacy claims so the apothecary business had a lot of snake oil salesmen. So he needed the trust of the community to say, hey, I am not a fake, I'm not a con man. Uh, my products are potent and real. Um, Henry Pafford officially took over the apothecary in early 1852 after briefly running the store for Harvey's widow. Pafford gained his knowledge and benefited by being an apprentice of Hav Harvey and Pafford's father was also in the same business. So he had family history and someone else to guide him after uh, Harvey passed. In 1860, he moved the practice to Queen Street, only a few doors down from the Pafford business block. In 1868, he purchased the current location at the corner of King and Queen Street. He had the whole building renovated to his specifications, which can still be seen by visiting the Niagara Apothecary Museum. It's still in pretty much the same condition. James DeWitt Randall uh, graduated from the Ontario School of Pharmacy in 1887. This is where we begin to see a shift towards pharmacy and less apothecary practices. Um, he was actually an apprentice of Henry Pafford. You'll notice that's a pretty much a trend um, until his untimely death in 1914. Randall was involved with the community. He was Lord Mayor for 1907 to 1909 and part of 1912. He was also the Chief Magistrate in 1913. Randall was smart and capitalized on the steam line, um, steam train line and the electric trams by converting counter space to selling train tickets. When he died in 1914, Randall's widow rented the space to Arthur James Coyne, a pharmacist from St. Catharines. Randall was also the first to photograph the interior of the apothecary, which is about 1900 to 1910. Um, at this time, the original gaslight fixtures had been converted to electric. I point that out as Randall was Lord Mayor when the first electric transmission line came into town in about 1908. Um, it's a really gorgeous picture of the inside and this was used for when they uh, renovated the building to make it look about this time period. Arthur James Coyne was the next in line to run the business. However, he did not have a connection to Randall. Coyne was never an apprentice here. Coyne did, he did graduate from the Ontario College of Pharmacy in 1909 with a diploma to practice. Before taking over the store, he already had a pharmacy at 116 Lake Street in St. Catharines. He used Coyne drugs for the name of the practice, which was prominently displayed on the exterior signage from 1914 through 1922. Uh, Coyne is quoted to have stated that he was run off his feet in the summer and starved in the winter. So it is no wonder that he branched out to other products to keep afloat. His business also advertised the sale of gasoline, along with tobacco, Kodak camera supplies, postcards, K2 
candies and sundries. He also had parcel pickup in his store. So this is one of the labels from the collection about um, picking up your parcel and what time the little hands can be written on. Um, when Coyne ended his run of the business in 1922, he also took all of the bottles and equipment with him. This wasn't necessarily a terrible thing as it was all outdated equipment for his profession anyways. His successor would probably thank him for moving nearly 100 years worth of stuff on the shelves. The restoration group really did thank Coyne when he was able to return all of these original items or most of, uh, which are currently on display in the Niagara Apothecary Museum. Erlen Field took over the practice from Coyne in 1922. To the people of Niagara and Lake, this business was known as Field's Drugs. Field had apprenticed with Randall and graduated from the Ontario College of Pharmacy School in 1913. And he didn't take over the store from Randall because he actually enlisted in the Canadian Army Medical Corps on June 21st, 1915 at Camp Niagara. He became part of the 5th Canadian Field Ambulance, then in 1917 transferred to the 1st Canadian Clearing Station. He returned to Canada in July of 1919 after serving a total of two years, nine months. Field was also an executive member of the local legion at its founding meeting. He took over the business in 1922 and was fully into the pharmacy business and left the apothecary behind. He revamped the business and took down the large advertising signs and instead used window displays that featured toiletries, toiletries, cosmetics, and hair products. When Field's health declined in 1964, he actually closed the pharmacy. And in 1965, he made sure that the Niagara Foundation and the Ontario College of Pharmacists had the first right to purchase the property. The apothecary at the corner of King and Queen Streets opened in 1869 at this location and was operated until it closed in 1964. It reopened in 1971 by the Ontario Heritage Foundation and the Ontario College of Pharmacists. The Ontario Heritage Foundation acquired the property from the local Niagara Foundation, led its restorations, and opened it as a museum in 1971. The Niagara College of Pharmacists accepted the responsibility to restore the professional practice aspects um, to the Confederation period. The college also agreed with the Ontario College of, sorry, the Ontario Heritage Federation to operate the apothecary as a museum for an initial period of 35 years. And this agreement has currently been extended as it's still running. Um, I mentioned that Randall had the chandeliers converted to electric. However, over the years, they were replaced by more modern lighting. During the restoration project, there is mention that the original chandeliers are in private homes. So that's mentioned in the 80s. So I don't know if they're still there. Um, so they did their best to find similar lights. So here's a nice example of what that lovely chandelier looks like in the building. And perhaps one of the apothecary's most distinguished visitors since its restoration has been the late Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. In 1981, on the occasion of the 200th anniversary of the founding of what is now Niagara on the Lake, uh, when she stopped to dedicate the plaque recognizing the apothecary's importance and signed the guest register for a brief, after a brief tour. There's a lovely picture of the Queen Mother. You now have a bit of a timeline on the development of the Niagara Apothecary as a business. Uh, we should also take a look at some of the interesting items in the museum's collection. So citrate of magnesia is used to clean stool from the intestine before surgery, and it may also be used for relief of constipation. The magnesia pills pulls water into the intestine, so it needs to be taken with lots of water. In a smaller dosage, it was used as a mild antacid. You can still buy this at most pharmacies. Uh, so, you know, if it's not broken, why fix it? Um, this one is a pretty straightforward uh, magnesium preparation in a, in a salt form with a citric acid. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio. It's a pretty easy chemistry mix for an apothecary to make. We also have rhubarb is another common item. Most people, some people grow it in their garden. Um, it's used primarily for digestive complaints, including diarrhea, heartburn, stomach pain, 
gastrointestinal bleeding, and preparation for certain GI diagnostic procedures. Uh, we have two preparations for the same item. A tincture is a medicine made by dissolving a drug in alcohol. It's a concentrated liquid herbal extract. And a syrup is a liquid concentration of medicine and sugar. So you can see that syrup would be more inclined for children to take. It would probably taste better. Um, and on this label, um, Randall is listed as a chemist and druggist. He would have been the one mixing these items. Up next is Superior Bay Rum. Uh, this item was actually purchased from outside companies. Uh, the bottle on this slide is, uh, I actually pulled it from Google just as an example of what the bottle would look like. Um, we have the label in the collection, but not the bottle. Superior Bay Rum was a multi-use product. It was used as an aftershave, a hair and scalp balm, after bath and as a cologne. It was essentially rum and spices used to smell like. Um, you can still buy this product, but mostly it's easier to find online with it being alcohol based. It's kind of hard to cross borders. Um, there's some regulations on that. Um, next slide. Sulfur tonic. So let's break this name down. A tonic is another of those descriptive words. It describes all sort of concoctions that were supposed to make you feel better or livelier. Some helped and some didn't. It was a good word for those snake oil salesmen to use. Uh, Coca-Cola was originally marketed as a tonic back when it contained cocaine as well as loads of caffeine. Uh, thanks to its antimicrobial properties, sulfur has been used for centuries to help treat acne and other skin, skin conditions. I can see how people would see that as making you feel better and livelier. Sulfur is used to treat several health conditions, especially skin problems such as psoriasis, eczema, and acne, among other things. It is still around as an option, but you should definitely consult a doctor before using this item, so don't just go buy it at a pharmacy. Um, definitely check on that one. Susnic acid is used to treat blemishes, heal scarring, and improve signs of aging. It also helps to reduce skin oil levels, making it a match made in heaven for oily and acne prone skin types. It works by helping to peel away dead skin cells from pores to keep them clear. So it's kind of like a chemical peel. Um, this light item is listed as a, as a poison because depending on dosage and long-term exposure, this medicine can have negative effects. So I definitely don't recommend looking at this one as an option, just try some other things. I'm just going to go with this one's called dog bane or Indian hemp and rheumatism root. It's got a couple of names. Um, it's used in herbal medicine to treat fever and dysentery. Um, it's also a sedative that slows your pulse. A weak tea can be made from the dried root, which has been used for cardiac diseases and to stop internal parasites. And the milky sap from the plant is applied topically as a folk remedy for venereal warts. So this one's that overall, different parts of the plant can do different things. Um, there's a nice picture at the top there of what that plant looks like. Um, it's kind of an interesting plant. Um, boracic acid, which is also referred to as boric acid, in a solution contains antiseptic properties that helps in treating minor wounds such as cuts and burns. It's helpful in treating various types of ear infections in both humans and pets. And it can also help to treat smelly feet. This label provides directions on how to use boracic acid as a mouthwash, an eye wash, and as a dusting for controlling perspiration. It's low in toxic to toxicity to pe if people eat it. Um, however, it is also used in bug killers. So this one's a not very safe item, but it's a very basic um, item that apothecaries could have and it treats lots of topical items. I think the perspiration and the smelly feet would be a big one for a lot of people to have a problem, a solve for a problem. The transition into pharmacy. Um, the transition to more pharmacy practices occurred gradually. The Philadelphia College of Pharmacy was created in 1821 and published its first book in 1824. And that book was actually a cookbook of previously secret recipes for medications. So you can say that they're telling secrets, but they're also um, created a competition 
um, pharmacists across the growing country began concocting a growing stream of medications. So it increased productivity and mass change. Uh, the change was also needed as compounded botanical drugs varied widely in potency, even when made by expert pharmacists or apothecaries from the same recipe. The active ingredients in botanicals differ based on specific variety, growing conditions, processing, storage, and other variables. So needing these changes were um, really well, really needed for the communities. Um, the Park, Davis, and Company uh, transformed the practice of business of pharmacy with its first standardized uh, pharmaceutical extract, which was made in 1879. Uh, this allowed DuPont, Lilly, Bayer, Pfizer, and a growing list of chemical companies to rapidly expand research and development programs to create and commercialize an ever-growing list of standardized pharmaceutical products and medication delivery systems. By 1900, most pharmacies carried manufactured medications and compounding was on the wane. Over Erland Field's 42 years, so that's 1922, through 1964, as pharmacist and owner, he witnessed many momentous changes in the practice of pharmacy and many advancements. There were multiple changes to the education requirements of becoming a pharmacist and the development of a multi-year university program. There was a discovery of insulin and penicillin, a vaccine for tuberculosis and scoliosis, uh, a home, home pregnancy test became available and fluorinated water was introduced. He also had to work with developing regulations. So in 1929, the Canadian Opium and Narcotic Drug Act was the first comprehensive Canadian legislation to control the sale and distribution of narcotics. Some of these products were just on the shelf that you could ask for and take. Now you need, there needed to be controlled. You need prescriptions to get them. In the 1930s, there were stronger food and drug legislation due to mistakes in the preparation of medications that resulted in multiple deaths. Um, the advancement in science and understanding how to use these medications changed the, changed the profession. As we progress, we will see more items that are manufactured offsite and packaged by large companies. Um, on this label at the bottom, you will see AJ Coin listed as the Canadian agent and dispensing chemist. This was a product from an outside company. The label is for a bottle of cream of almonds and witch hazel. This was an exquisite lotion for the cure of chapped hands, face and lips and all roughness of the skin. Witch hazel has a history as an anti-inflammatory, topical extract useful for skin toning, cleaning, calming and healing. Almonds are a great source of vitamin E and fatty acids that provide intensive moisture for skin. I have not seen these items combined but I do own them separately, and I would say that they do work for what they claim. Also, the label is quite nice on this one. This box is for military white liniment cam camphorated. Uh, beside it is an example of a product sold in drugstores today, so it's still on the shelves. It was used as a universal remedy for rheumatic pain, neuralgia, sprains, bronchial troubles, and other topically treated ailments like bug bite pain. Uh, a liniment is a type of topical bomb that is used to carry medicine and is applied with force. You got to rub it in. It is much thicker than a cream or a lotion. The side of this box gives directions to rub it into an affected area several times a day. Camphor is a powder that originally came from the bark and wood of the camphor tree. Today it is mostly synthetic item and if it's still being used today then I think it is safe to say it does work. It was not a snake oil. So the sweet spirit of, you call it nitrate, but I've also seen it pronounced as nitre. Um, it is a nitric acid. It was used to reduce fever, treat cold sores, relieve muscle spasms, reduce belching and abdominal pain, and to promote production and excretion of urine. I would be a little leery of a miracle cure-all. This drug did a lot of different things. Um, it was actually banned as over-the-counter medicine by the FDA in 1980, and the quoted reason being it can be fatal to infants and because of lack of proved effectiveness. It is also easy to breathe in a high dose of ethyl nitrate vapors without realizing it. Um, nitrate vapors replace the oxygen in your bloodstream, and as everyone knows, oxygen is key for our survival. 
So it's sometimes a good thing when the FDA puts a little regulations and prescription requirements on items. I don't really know how to pronounce the name of this one. So I'm just gonna call it epinephrine, which is also what it is known as. Um, as a cream, it was used as a local anesthetic ointment. It constricts the blood vessels. So during surgery, there is less bleeding. Now epinephrine is usually injected. Think EpiPens. It is used to uh, cause gastrointestinal relaxation. It stimulates the heart and dilates bronchi, bronchi, which can help with asthmatic symptoms and those with allergic reactions. Gin pills for the kidneys. Uh, this tin, tin contains 40 pink pills and an instruction pamphlet printed in 10 languages, which I think that's a pretty interesting feature. Um, these pills are recommended for laying back, irritation of the kidneys or bladder, bedwetting, or mucus deposits in the urine. You're supposed to take one or two pills four times a day before or after meals and at bedtime. The key ingredient in these pills is three eighths of a grain of methylene blue per dose. Uh, methylene blue is currently used in medical procedures as a dye to make fluids more visible. It also tends to make you pee green, which can be a fun party trick. Um, I was not able to find a source that can confirm that these pills actually did anything when taken other than that fun party trick. However, the copyright on the packaging design was updated in 2020 and has been used since the product was first sold in 1923. So this one is more the packaging that is impressive than the item itself. Bromoform, which was originally, when it was introduced, it was a sedative and an anti-convulsive. The paper around it acted as a safety seal, which we have come leaps and bounds since wrapping it in essentially wax paper. Um, it has also been used as a solvent, a sedative, and a flame retardant. I don't think I want to take anything that's also a flame retardant. Today, it is mainly used as a laboratory reagent, uh, for example, as an extraction solvent, so it's used in the chemical um, reactions. Also, injections of bromoform are sometimes used instead of epinephrine to treat severe asthma cases. Friars balsam is a strong smelling solution of benzoin resin in ethanol with aloes. Uh, it can be used on minor skin sores and wounds to protect from infection. It has been used in lotions for chapped hands and by steam inhalation for coughs and croup. It is highly flammable due to the ethanol. Um, the in the in individual run pharmacy is few and far between now and um, the most common is a chain drugstore. Uh, I chose this bottle because it is made by the Rexall Drug Company, which is now a well-known chain of pharmacies. Um, there's a lot of things that happened over the last 100 years, 150 years that have brought us around to a chain drugstore. Uh, the advancement into a pharmacy practice was gradual with every new owner. Each person brought new techniques and skills while also learning from the previous owner. Uh, since the early 1900s, there has been the introduction of governing bodies, regulations, and testing requirements. All this built to develop apothecaries into pharmacy. So I thank you for attending and listening to me talk about some of the interesting items uh, in our collection. Uh, if you have any questions, I am hopefully can answer some of them. Um, thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, I was just going to start the questions off with my own question <laughs> and also for everyone's benefit. Um, some of these items that we have in the collection, I mean, they have old medicines and, you know, acidic products and stuff in them. So how do we store them or keep them just so that they're safe from people or what do we wear so that we don't get anything <laughs> on us? <laughs> um, there are documents and labels on the contain the, the overall boxes that contain these items in our collection. Um, the goal is to have most of them emptied professionally by a pharmacist that would know how to handle the items now. Um, obviously over years they degrade and change so we don't I don't want to inhale that. Um, so proper gloves 
um, inhalation. So you want to wear a mask. Uh, nice N94 would be great. Um, sometimes even wearing protective goggles. Uh, you don't want those fumes to get into your eyes. Um, and just proper notification of what you're handling. And if you're not, a, not aware of what you are handling, better to go off of everything. <laughs> wear it all. Uh, Adrian Stevenson, who's watching the presentation, uh, just says, excellent. She's a toxicologist, so she's familiar with some of some of the items, but not everything. So especially interesting to her. Um, and she also wondered if there was any information, even just some of the names of the er other early apothecaries that you mentioned early on. Did you come across names of any of those? Um, like out outside of the Niagara apothecary? Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, Shauna sent me one about Dr. Miller. Um, she was, it was actually a woman, which was pretty neat. Um, her husband was Dr. Miller. And when he passed, um, her opinion was still taken and she pretty much just took over his practice after he passed and became Dr. Miller herself. So she was pretty cool. Um, there was also one in one of the Secord family houses, I believe David Secord out, um, I think that's more Willoughby direction. Um, those were the early 1800s as well. Um, Pretty much anybody that had, had a garden and some know-how and um, could compound things and produce it to others, they were um, in the business. Um, Bev would like to know if you had done any research into the manufacturers of um, the bottles for any of the pharmaceuticals. Um, I haven't really looked into the manufacturers of bottles themselves. I did do some research into the development of bottles, such as um, when you would go into your medicine cabinet at night and you're looking for that heartburn medication, you wanna grab the right bottle, not the cough syrup medicine or something worse um, like the spirit of nitre. Um, so they would have different shapes um, and different colors because some can't be exposed to light. Um, and then you would also have that visual cue. A lot of people back in the day and some even today don't have great reading skills um, or understand what they're looking at. So if you had the color like red for stop, um, blue, green for go sort of thing, um, uh, those visual cues help with the process of knowing what you're grabbing. But I have not looked indirectly to the manufacturers of the bottles themselves. Um, and then she also wondered about any of the tools used in preparation. Do we have any of those in our collection or did you come across anything on those? We do have a lot of the tools. Um, mortar, mortar and pestle obviously is the key symbol of um, apothecaries. Um, that's why it was the golden mortal and pestle at the sign of the tavern. Um, and weights and measures. Um, the stirring stick actually is the key tool used, but uh, it, it didn't make for an impressive symbol, little rod, um, glass droppers and beakers, um, the whole process, like the, the image we have on the left there, the black and white one, it shows some little mortars and pestles and bottles. Um, so yeah, we have a bunch of the tools. Uh, they just weren't as interesting as the bottles to put on display. <laughs> Some of the early pictures that you showed, the labels looked like pretty pristine. So would those have been ones um, that maybe were just in, you know, fields archives or something that we would have um, uh, obtained after the, the apothecary closed? Yes, um, well, they would probably get printed a huge stack of them, just like business cards. And by the time you're ready to get the new batch, you just kind of push the old ones aside or as a new, um, owner would come in, you don't want to use the labels of the previous owner because it has their name on it. Um, to me, because um, I can still remember when you used to lick stamps, the back side of them looks like you're supposed to lick them and stick them. Um, I'm not going to try that because they are artifacts. So I'm just going to assume that's how you applied them. Um, so they have like a glue residue on the back side of each one. They are unused labels. Um, for each one of those, we have anywhere from two to 15 of each label. Very interesting. So I think that's it for questions. If anyone else has any questions, feel free to send them through, or you can also just email them to us at contact at nhsm.ca and uh, we can try and get answers for you. So thank you again, Caitlin. Oh, I just saw one pop up. Um, <laughs> did one of the apothecaries live on Gage Street in Niagara-on-the-Lake? Did you come across anyone on Gage Street? 
I did not, but we can research that one. Yeah, we can definitely look into that. That's Diane Tickner. Um, Diane, if you want to send us an email, um, just so that we have uh, your contact back, that would be great. And then we can look into that for you. So thanks so much, Caitlin, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Our next lecture is in two weeks on uh, March 16th at 11, and uh, Babs Worthy is going to be interviewing Leonard Connolly about 60 years of the Shaw Festival. So that one would be interesting for the Shaw's uh, 60th anniversary this year. So hope to see you, and thanks again for joining us today. Bye, everyone. Bye.